So now it's my pleasure. Uh, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker. I have a little bit to read about him, and then I'll just say a few words because I've had a chance to chat with him this morning. So Michael Hingson, uh, I'll do the reading part first, and then I'll say a few thoughts. On September 11, 2001, Michael, man who's blind, escaped the World Trade Center by walking down 78 flights of stairs with his guide dog, Roselle. He now has uh, Alamo with him today. America fell in love with the pair and the special bond that helped them both survive one of the country's darkest days. From the day he received his first guide dog at 14 years old, Michael has been developing and fostering skills in leadership, trust, teamwork, ad adaptation, and more. He is an ambassador for the National Braille Literacy Campaign for the National Federation of the Blind and also serves as ambassador for the American Humane Association's 2012 Hero Dog Awards. I had, uh, when, when I knew who was coming to speak, uh, I looked him up on YouTube, and so I watched some uh, there and enjoyed what I saw there, and then I had the chance to talk with him for about a half hour this morning, just get to know him a little bit better. I think we are in for a real treat, um, and uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome Michael Hingson. Forward. Wow. Put your water. I'm over this way. Come on. Now. You want water underneath? Yeah. Okay. I'll wait till you grab your That's keyboard. Well, thank you very much, Troy. I really appreciate you and your introduction. Thank you. Actually, I consider introductions unnecessary, but if it's the custom to have them, if I have the opportunity, I really wish to do it myself. That way I can get in all the facts. <laughs> I was born modest, <laughs> but it wore off. <sighs> Actually, once I was introduced to um, an, an audience by a lawyer who kept his hands in his pockets, and he came to the podium and he introduced us as Michael Hinkson and Roselle, two very rare creatures indeed. They're survivors of the World Trade Center attacks on September 11th, 2001. I wasn't sure how to respond to that, <clears throat> but inspiration struck as I came to the podium, and I said, it actually seemed to me we had a much rarer creature in our midst, and that was a lawyer who kept his hands in his own pockets. <laughs> <laughs> this is my colleague, Alamo. Alamo is a black Labrador. Any blind people in the room? Say aye. Okay. Um, he's a black lab. He is three years and will be five months old on October 14th. So he's been a guide dog for about a year and, well, a year and a half now. So he still acts like a puppy. Um, I, if, if you come by the table that we have um, set up downstairs, then I will um, take his harness off and you will be able to, to pet him. We have a table because I've written a book that's a number one New York Times best-selling book called Thunder Dog, the story of a blind man, a guide dog, and the triumph of trust. And we'll be selling it down there. Oh, go ahead. And what I'll, I always do is I'll take the harness off and uh, we'll just tie Alamo's leash to the table and hope he doesn't pull it away. But um, <laughs> if you buy a book, you can visit with Alamo. No, we really don't put conditions on it. <laughs> Alamo doesn't care if you buy a book or not. He would just prefer the attention. <laughs> so the last thing before we really get started, uh, I, I, I told Gary over here I would pick on him. Um, he came up and asked if I needed any, any help with timing, you know, and he said, you want to make sure that you end on time because these people have lots of other things to do. And uh, Gary said he's going to hold up a sign, which I wasn't sure that was going to <laughs> So I, I'm just pointing out that I, um, either we're going to have a religious miracle or, or whatever here because I'm speaking until I see the sign. <laughs> I, I really am honored to be here. Um, I am, I guess, in a sense, a product of special education in California. L let me tell you a little bit about me in all seriousness. I was born in 1950, February 24th, 1950. You can do the math. Yes, I'm 69. 
People say I don't sound it, so I'm very happy about that, and I hope that that continues for a long time. But I was born sighted, <clears throat> but I was born too much premature, and the result of that was that I was put in an incubator with a pure oxygen environment. You've probably heard something about what today is called retinopathy o prematurity, which back in the day, I don't know where that expression came from, but it was called retrolentral fibroplasia. It was something that was discovered and named by Dr. Arnold Papps at the Wilmer Eye Institute. I had the pleasure of meeting him a few years ago before he passed, and we discussed what was originally called RLF, which is now ROP. But the bottom line is, is I was put in an incubator, the retina malformed, and I became blind after about two days. We didn't know that for a while. I certainly didn't know it, but my parents didn't know it. And about four months after I was born, an aunt said to my mother, you know, he's not really reacting to sunlight. I wonder if there's something wrong with his eyes. Well, sure enough, we went to the hospital and the doctors eventually came out and said, yes, he is blind, he can't see, and you should send him to a home because you shouldn't keep him with you. If you do, he will not be good for your family. He'll certainly make it harder for your older son who can see, who is two years old. You should send him to a home. My father had an eighth grade education. My mother had a high school diploma, and they told the Learned Medical Society in Chicago, nuts to you. We're taking him home. The doctor said he'll never be able to contribute to society, and they said, sure he will. It doesn't matter if he's blind or not. What matters is what he learns. These people who certainly didn't have the, the vast knowledge of the learned medical profession in Chicago bucked the system. I did go home. I was born on the south side of Chicago, about, if we, if we take Geraldo Rivera into account, two blocks from Al Capone's private vault. But <laughs> I was born in Chicago, grew up there for five years, went to the candy store when I was old enough to do it with my brother and cousins who lived next door every day and walked around the neighborhood and so on and did it just like anyone else. I never even thought about it because my parents didn't think about it. They were risk takers, although I'm sure they didn't think of it that way, but they were. They let me go outside and be a part of the rest of the kids in the neighborhood and growing up. They, although I didn't know it early on, were a part of a group of parents who fought for special education classes for blind kids. See, there were a number of premature births during the baby boomer era, it actually brought the average age of blind people down from 67 to 65 because there were so many. But there were enough in Chicago, and my parents fought with other parents for special education classes. Well, kindergarten starts at age of four in Chicago, and so um, at four years old, I went to kindergarten in a special class with a teacher who was going to teach me and a bunch of other blind kids something about school. I actually began to learn Braille in kindergarten. I remember, I wish I still had it. I remember um, she, in teaching me Braille, said, best way for you to learn Braille is to write something. I'm gonna read you a story about nasturtiums. Anybody know how to spell nasturtiums? I don't remember. <laughs> but I had to write the story down. Now it was in what was called grade one or uncontracted Braille. I hadn't learned grade two yet. But I learned the Braille alphabet in kindergarten. Hello. And um, then my father was offered a job in Southern California and we moved to California, <clears throat> Palmdale, California. And the problem with moving to Palmdale, California was that there were no provisions at all for blind or any other kinds of kids with what we call today's disabilities or special needs or whatever you politically want to call it. I'm not really a great fan of political correctness, so let me be real blunt. I am blind. I'm not vision impaired. I don't have a visual handicap. I am blind. By the way, I am trying to help start a movement. What I am not is visually impaired. The last time I checked, being blind didn't have any effect on how you looked. So visually impaired really doesn't count. <laughs> If you're going to do it, vision impaired is more accurate than visually impaired because I really probably would look the same if I am blind or sighted. 
We'll deal with the glasses later. I normally don't wear glasses, but that's another story and we'll get to it. Vision impaired, I understand. Visually impaired really is ridiculous, but it's the term that people have used, so you need to help us change the habit. But in reality, I am blind. Let me define blind. A person is blind when they lose enough of their eyesight that they have to use, let me rephrase that, that they will use alternative techniques to eyesight in order to accomplish tasks whether it be reading or whatever. Yes, you can get very thick lens glasses or CCTVs and so on to help a person use their eyesight to read, but they're blind. By any standard of intelligence, if you think about it, they are blind. Not that they don't have any eyesight, but they have to use alternative techniques and they don't have to use eyesight. I have been in environments, I have been involved in projects uh, as an adult where I've been in special education um, schools where we've been discussing how to teach braille reading and so on. And I've had teachers who would come up to me and talk about the fact that they have kids who are blind and kids who have some eyesight. They're legally blind, but not totally blind. Sally has some eyesight. Johnny doesn't have any. Sally gets to read print. Johnny has to read braille. That attitude is so backward, or it should be considered backward. The problem is Sally may get to read print, but she's going to have headaches, she's going to read very slow, and if Johnny gets to truly learn Braille, he's going to be reading at several hundred words a minute while Sally is kind of poking along and having headaches and not doing very well. I have no problem with children or adults using their eyes if they have eyesight. I do have a problem with them not also having the opportunity to learn the techniques that blind people use because if they learn those techniques, then you, they can use both worlds to live much more productive lives. And so for those of you who are special ed teachers, even if your children have some eyesight and even if the parents resist, try to push back. They need to learn Braille. A lot of special education teachers have said to me, well, but blind people don't need Braille anymore. It's passe. You can listen to books and so on. <clears throat> You've got recordings. We've now got, of course, um, files, and you can use synthetic speech to hear the books read. <clears throat> yeah, listen to one of those books with synthetic speech and see how much you enjoy it. But, <laughs> but yes, it's available. But my question to any of those people is, Tell me why you still teach sighted kids to read print. Why, they could watch cartoons. They could watch TV. Why do they need to learn to read print? The bottom line is blindness isn't the problem that I face. The problem I face consists truly of the attitudes and misconceptions that people have about blindness. And it still comes back down to the fact that in reality, People think that blind people can't truly be as productive in society as people who can see. <clears throat> ah, and I wanted to do something before we go on. How many here are special ed teachers? Let me just see. All right, how many are HR people? All right, a few of you get it, so I'm gonna stop right now and say for those of you who didn't clap, how many of you think it's bright when a lecturer asks you a question and they're blind that you raise your hands? <laughs> and you prove my point. <laughs> so the bottom line is blindness isn't the problem. There are so many people in the world who are blind who have accomplished every bit as much, if not more, than most people in society because they've learned that eyesight isn't really the gating factor. The gating factor are our attitudes about blindness. Jacob Balotin was a cardiologist who didn't live a long life. I think he died at 36. He, was in the early, he lived in the early 1900s. He was blind. And he was one of the most famous heart doctors in the Chicago area. There's a book about him called The Good Doctor. You ought to try to find it and read it. It's a fascinating read. There are so many others. Jacobus Tembrook was the founder of the National Federation of the Blind. He was born in Canada, but lost his eyesight at the age of seven, lived most of his life in the United States. Dr. Tembrook uh, was taught by Dr. Newell Perry in, uh, in Albany at the School for the Blind at that time. 
and learned that, in fact, he could do whatever he chose to do. Blindness wasn't the problem. Dr. Tembrook went through um, the standard education courses and eventually had, um, had uh, taken um, lectureships in, at the University of California at Berkeley, did his undergraduate work there. He wanted to go into law, but when he graduated and expressed that interest, the school said, no, you can't, because a blind person can't do that. You could get a degree in psychology, you could get your PhD in psychology, but you can't get a law degree, because blind people can't do that. Way too much reading, way too complicated. So Dr. Tembrook bowed to the pressure and got his degree in psychology, and then was hired to teach at UC Berkeley. I don't remember the exact year, but somewhere along the line, um, he was asked to chair the speech department at the University of California at Berkeley. Now, Dr. Tembrook, who was by then married to his wife, Hazel, was a pretty bright guy, kind of guy. Dr. Tembrook accepted the position and said to the entire university, I want faculty members to join my speech department. But if you're going to join this department, what you need to understand is that you have to undertake a discipline different from your discipline of education. So if you're a physicist, for example, and you want to join my department, you've got to do research on something other than physics. You can tie it back to physics, but you have to do something other than physics as your main effort of work in our department. Well, Dr. Tenbrook was one of these guys who believed in practicing what he preached. What do you think that he decided to do his discipline on? Dr. Tembrook became one of the foremost constitutional law scholars of the 20th century. There are still many cases that use his treatises on tort law, and many examples of his works on discrimination and so on are used today. In 1940, he formed with others the National Federation of the Blind, the largest organization of blind people, consumers in the United States. Uh, and we don't have time to go into a lot of his work. But the point is, it didn't matter that he was blind. He did get to law. And he did it in a roundabout way, but he did it in a way that the university had to accept. And they loved him for it. In fact, that Dr. Tembrick was one of the few people in California who has ever been asked by both political parties to run for the United States Senate. And that happened after Senator Claire Ingle uh, had a stroke, and, and he obviously could not continue as uh, senator and passed away, Dr. Tembrook was asked by both parties to, to run, and he refused because he was enjoying his work with the National Federation of the Blind. He was involved in forming the free speech movement at UC Berkeley and so on and doing so much constitutional law work. He knew that's what he needed to do. Blindness isn't the problem. And so the question that all of you need to consider is are you going to hold people back or are you going to truly embrace a positive philosophy that says blind people, blind students can do whatever they choose, and we're going to challenge them just like we would challenge any other student, and we're going to challenge them to do the best that they can truly do, and we're going to help teach them what they need. And sometimes that's going to mean you need to do as much work to educate parents because parents are frightened. They don't know. They're victims, I won't say products, they're victims of the same society that has negative attitudes about blindness. And I know there's only so much you can do, but you can set the tone. All of you here, not just in special education, but all of you here can set the tone. To give you an example of the kinds of attitudes that I faced, we moved to uh, Victorville, California in 2014. <laughs> Where do you live in Victorville? Victorville. Where do you live? Uh, almost at Orlando. Okay, we live in Spring Valley Lake. Yay! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Other side. <laughs> we, we chose property and built a house on it. My wife happens to be in a wheelchair and has been in a chair her whole life. So we, um, we, we knew that if you buy a house and modify it, it costs a lot of money. If you build a house, it doesn't cost anything to build in the accessibility. And we found a piece of property very close to the Victorville uh, Spring Valley Lake Country Club, so we get to walk to, breakfast, to, uh, to dinner when we want to go out to eat, which is great. Anyway, 
Um, before we moved to Victorville in 2013, my wife and I were in an Ikea store with a couple of other people. And this young 13-year-old boy comes up to me and he says, I'm sorry. And I stood there for a second and I said, well, what are you sorry about? Well, because you can't see. Now, I didn't know this kid, but that was his attitude. And I probably didn't answer in the best way that I could, but I said, well, I'm sorry that you can because you don't get what I get. And, and by that time, his mother saw that he was talking to this blind kid and called him away and told him that, to not bother the blind man. But, you know, the, the bottom line is we're no different than anyone else. We don't have the disability that all of you have. You know, in the 1800s, Thomas Edison invented the electric light bulb. Why did he do that? Because, as we now understand with the Americans with Disabilities Act, it was a reasonable accommodation for light-dependent people who can't function in the dark. <laughs> You light-dependent people, I know there are more of you than there are of me, <laughs> but we're going to get you in a dark alley one night and we'll see who can read. <laughs> when, I was in, at, when I was at UC Irvine one night, I was sitting in my room and I was, by the way, I have a master's degree in physics from UC Irvine. And I also have a secondary teaching credential from the Department of Education, the School of Teaching at UC Irvine. And one day I was sitting in my room, well, one night I was sitting in my, uh, my dorm room and I was reading some physics thing. I don't remember what it was, probably some quantum mechanics or whatever. And a bunch of people walked by and I just yelled, hello. And they stopped. And they go, well, hello, who's there? And I said, it's me, I'm Mike. Well, good to meet you. What are you doing? Because my lights were off, right? I believe in saving electricity because <laughs> it helps California. You know, blind people, blind people in 2000 saved California from total blackout with the power <laughs> problems because we didn't need to turn the lights on, you know. In any case, um, they said, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading. And they just sort of laughed and they walked off. They didn't understand. <laughs> you know, I have a bad sense of humor. Um, <laughs> I remember getting some help when I was a freshman. Um, I lived in the dorm with all the jocks, all the, the football. Well, they, we didn't have football, but we had a, a national championship water polo team. And I said, let's have some fun. So we, th there were like four girls' dorms and four guys' dorms. And I said, let's put up signs. And we put up signs, wanted young female assistant to aid in scientific braille research. No one ever took me up on it. I was very disappointed. <laughs> but, you know, again, it isn't, it isn't a blindness issue. So I did go to college. I graduated. I had several jobs that eventually led me to be in the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. I was there as the Mid-Atlantic Region Sales Manager for Quantum Corporation, which was a Fortune 500 computer company. I had been hired two years before to open an office for Quantum in New York City. I was living back there because I'd been transferred by another company from California to sell in New York City because I had been doing it by phone and I made the case for the fact that we needed to do it on site. I actually wanted to, to be down in Virginia and work in federal sales, but one night the president of the company had a strange epiphany and suddenly he changed our brain overnight and I was told that we want you to open the office in New York City drove my wife crazy, but we moved and, and was almost a divorce over it. She would move to Virginia. But she didn't want to live in the New York area. But that's where the job was. And if I didn't accept that job, the only other sales position open for the company that I was working for at the time was in New Mexico. And I wasn't going to move to New Mexico because I thought I'd have a better income opportunity in New York than New Mexico. Um, maybe, maybe some flying saucer would have met me at Roswell and given me a bunch of money, but I doubt it. I've been to Roswell, though. Had a ride to one of those flying saucers, but I can't tell you anymore, otherwise we'd have to make you disappear. <laughs> no, I, I did go there and spoke once a couple of years ago. It was fun. Um, in any case, so I was asked to open an office, because uh, I had been recruited by Quantum, to do that. We opened the office on the 78th floor of Tower 1 of the World Trade Center. The 78th floor is what's called a sky lounge, a sky lobby. That meant that elevators would go straight from floor one to 78 without stopping. The World Trade Center, the way it was structured was that 
you could take elevators to go from floor one up to some number of floors, but there were also direct elevators to floor 44 and to floor 78. The 44th floor was where the cafeteria was, the Port Authority cafeteria that everyone used. 78 was the next jumping off point. You would then go to other elevators to go to other floors or you'd take the stairs. Or in our case, we were fortunate to have our office right on the 78th floor. Again, had a lot of fun with that because I love to convince people that when they were gonna come and visit us, I'd say, now we've reserved a special elevator that's gonna take you straight to our floor. They didn't know the difference, it was great. <laughs> But in any case, um, we opened the office, and on September 11th, we were going to be holding some sales seminars to teach some of our resellers how to, te how to sell our products. I, uh, Articon, the, or excuse me, Quantum, the company I worked for then, Articon moved me to the East Coast, but uh, Quantum worked through a two-tier distribution and sales model. So typically, most of our products were sold to a few very large distributors, and they in turn signed the smaller resellers and the major distributor we worked with, Ingram Micro, wanted to make sure that their resellers knew how to sell our products, so they asked if we'd do the seminar, and we set it up for, of course, September 11th. By that time, I had my fifth guide dog, Roselle. Roselle was a yellow lab. Roselle was also a dog with a great sense of humor. She loved to steal socks. <laughs> she wouldn't eat them, she hid them. And I was warned, by her puppy raisers that she'd like to do that, and she did. She stole my wife's slippers once and hid them, and we had to find them. So in any case, we, uh, we and uh, Roselle and I were matched in 1999, and in 2001, she was very used to working in the World Trade Center with me. I had spent a lot of time when we started the office and started preparing to open the office, I had spent a great deal of time learning where everything in the World Trade Center was that I could possibly want to know about. I knew what was on most every floor, especially that would be a place where we might want to reach out and, and try to sell. I knew how to get around. I spent a lot of time studying emergency evacuation procedures. And almost every day when I went into the office, I remember thinking, now, if there's an emergency today, how am I going to get out? What am I going to do? And I made sure I knew the answers to those things. Because many times, I would be in the office alone. Nobody else would be there. Because I had a staff working for me, great sales guys. And their job was to go out and sell and support their manager, right? Um, so that was me. And my job was to be inside supporting them, going on sales calls with them from time to time. But a lot of times, I would be in the office alone fielding their questions, helping them in any way that I could, working to make sure that I knew everything that they might need to know so that I could enhance them out in the field. In fact, every salesperson I ever hired, I said, look, I know you're working for me, but I want you to understand that I view myself as a second person on your sales team. And what you and I need to do is to learn how we work together so I can add value to you and enhance what you do. My favorite example of that was with a guy named Kevin, who I hired. I really liked Kevin because when we were doing the interview, I said to him, like I did to everyone, tell me what you're gonna be selling for us and how you're gonna do it. Now, the typical answer for most people was, well, you're selling tape drives. We're gonna be selling the tape drives and I'm gonna learn all about those and I'm gonna go off and, and tell people how to do it and what, what they need to know so that they can buy it. That's the typical answer. Kevin's answer was the only person who ever gave it, and it was the answer I wanted to hear. The only thing I have to sell is me and my reputation, and I need your support. I won't do anything without telling you, but when we agree on something, I'm gonna go sell me, and through them, we'll, and through that, we'll sell the products. But if they don't believe me, they're not gonna be interested in our products, and I have to rely on you. What an answer. But it was the right answer, truly. So one day Kevin comes into my office and he says, hey, we have a sales opportunity out at Solomon Brothers. I said, okay. He said, they want me to come out and talk about our products for a project they have. I'm not sure that our products will really be what they want, but they want us to come and talk about it. 
and they wanted me to bring my manager along, a decision maker. I said, okay. He said, um, so they don't know you, so I didn't tell them you're blind. <laughs> now, by the way, I learned a lot about selling from taking a Dale Carnegie sales course. That's kind of important here. So we got to the meeting. We entered the building right at 10 o'clock. I wanted to arrive a minute or so late. I knew what Kevin meant when he said, I didn't tell him, you're blind. Because we were going to hit him right between the eyes with that. <laughs> so about 10.01, we're walking down the hall. We hear a bunch of people talking. A few of them were going, well, where are these quantum people and all that? We walk in the door, and the room goes totally silent. We stand there for a moment, and I turn to Kevin. I said, so where are we going to do this? He says, oh, right up here in the front. So we went up to the front. I had a laptop projector in hand on my laptop also. Opened up the cases, took things out, and says, where do we plug this stuff in? And he says, I'll take it, and he plugs it in. And meanwhile, I'm standing there facing this audience. And so I turned to my left, and I said to the person sitting right in the front row on the corner, who I heard as we walked by, I said, hi, my name is Mike Hinkson. Who are you? Nothing. Really, um, who are you? Nothing. So I kind of walk over near him and, and looking straight at him, and I said, I heard you when I walked by. Who are you? So finally he said, oh, my name is Joe. I said, good, glad to meet you. I went and shook his hand. I said, you know, it doesn't matter whether I'm blind or sighted. I know you're there. Don't know a lot about you yet, but I'm going to learn about you. So tell me, Joe, why are you interested in our tape drives? I didn't ask if he was interested. I asked him why. Because I knew from my Dale Carnegie sales course, you don't ask yes or no questions, unless you really know the answer. But you don't ask yes or no questions. That doesn't give you a lot of information. So Joe kind of hemmed and hawed and finally gave me an answer to that. And, and then I said, so tell me a little bit more about the project if you would. And he did. And then I went to the next person. And I went around the room. And I talked to those people, learning a lot, including our product wasn't going to do anything to help these people. <laughs> but we were there, so we did the presentation. I did the presentation. I had a script. I did the PowerPoint show. And I, my script was in incredible detail. And it said everything that I needed to know, including even on the screen, what picture appeared where. So I could point over my shoulder and say, on the left side of your screen, you'll see the ATLP 3000, which holds um, 16 tape drives and 326 tape cartridges. And we use a special technology called PRISM technology. Our system is very modular. We can actually connect five of those drives together, five of those libraries together, so that you could have a total of 80 tape drives and 1,620 um, tape cartridges all in one big library. And on the right side of your screen, you can see the ATLP 1000, which is a small single drive library with 30 tape drives and some things like that, and talk on and on and on. And we went off and we talked and all that. And we did the whole show. And then I said at the end, and as you can see, our product won't do what you want. <laughs> but I wanted you to know about it because I want you to understand what different systems can do. Now let me tell you a little bit about who has a product that will help you. My bosses would shoot me if they heard me say that. <laughs> but it's the ethical thing to do. And so we talked about that a little bit. And then we ended uh, the, the day. And, and people would come up to me. And we chatted some. And a couple came up. And they said, we're really angry at you. And I said, why? He said, well, usually when people come and they do these presentations, we just kind of fall asleep and veg out, you know, because they just keep talking and talking. But you never looked away and looked at the screen. You kept looking at us. We forgot you were blind. We didn't dare fall asleep. <laughs> And I said, well, you could have fallen asleep. The dog was down here. You may think he's asleep, but he's taking notes. <laughs> anyway, we ended and we went out. And Kevin said, how come you know so much about our products? And, and you knew some of these later things that I don't know. And I said, well, did you read the product bulletin that came out last week? Uh, well, no, I really didn't have time. I said, there you go. Message received and understood. But about two weeks later, the Solomon people called back and they said, we really do appreciate all that you did in coming out and talking with us. And we have something to tell you, and that is that there's another project. And because of everything that you taught us, we know that your product is perfect for it. We're not even putting it out for bid. Just give us a price. That's 
the ethics of it. That's the way to sell. And that's what we did. So in any case, um, I spent a lot of time learning what to do in the case of an emergency so that I could get out when necessary because I knew that people like Kevin and the rest of our sales and support staff would be out working a lot of times. And so I knew everything that I could possibly know about what to do in any kind of an unusual situation. On September 10th, I went home as usual. I took my laptop, which is what I used in the office. I backed up my data at home. I'm a good scout. I know how to be prepared. And sometimes I would work at home. So I always made sure I had my data backed up at home as well as um, on the job. By the way, speaking of scouts, as long as I'm bragging, I happen to be an Eagle Scout with two palms and vigil in the order of the arrow. Blindness isn't the issue. It's a lot of fun. I had some great scout leaders who accepted me for who I was, and, and that made all the difference. In any case, I backed up my data. Later that night, we went to bed. And about 12.30, Roselle started nudging me. Now, Roselle was afraid of thunder. And of course, we had rainstorms in New Jersey. We lived in Westfield, great town. Again, there we built our house. It was a two-story house. We put an elevator in so we could go to the two stories and the basement. So um, we had this nice elevator and a nice house. But Roselle now was bugging me at 1230, and I knew that there must be a storm coming. She usually gave us about a half hour warning because she could sense it, as we know, because the static charge would build up on her fur, as well as the fact that um, she probably heard the thunder before we do. And so Roselle was shaking and shivering and panting. And so I took Roselle. Karen, my wife, was awake by that time. And, I, and we both agreed there must be a storm coming. So we went downstairs to my basement, to our basement. I put Roselle under my desk, and I sat down and decided to try to do a little bit of work that I was going to do the next day before our sales seminars began. I turned on the stereo and had it pretty loud, hopefully masking some of the thunder sounds. But God has a sense of humor, I guess. Um, the storm literally came right over our house. It sounded like bombs going off outside. And poor as it, Roselle was just shaking. At least she didn't see the lightning because she was under the desk. We were there until about 2 o'clock. Then the storm left, and so I went back up, and we got three more hours of sleep and then got up to go into the office. I didn't think it was a bad sign of things to come. Some people have said, well, didn't you get the, the warning? Uh, no. <laughs> so we got uh, to the office at 740, and there was a guy there. He just pulled up with a cart. He was from the Port Authority cafeteria. He was bringing the breakfast that we ordered for the early arrivals and for the first group of seminar people. We had 50 people scheduled during the day to come to one of four seminars. About 8 o'clock, uh, some of our distribution people from Ingram Micro arrived along with David Frank from our corporate office. David was in charge of the distribution sales. And then he was there to help the Ingram Micro people talk about pricing. I was there because, of course, I'm the technical contact, the guy who would be on site in New York all the time. Uh, David was from New York, but he transplanted to California. And uh, so, so he was there, and I was there. We were the two quantum people. The Ingram Micro people were there. There were about five Ingram Micro people, six, actually, I guess. And then one of them decided about uh, quarter after 8 or 8.30 to go downstairs and to wait in the lobby and escort our distribution people to where they needed to go. The last thing we needed to do before the seminars were to start was to create a list of all the people who would be attending that day. If you wanted to go to the World Trade Center and go up and see anyone uh, at that time because of the bombing in 1993, you either had to have your name on a previously prepared list that was created on stationery from the company where you were going so they could check your name off after looking at your ID, or they would have to call us and say, is so-and-so allowed to come up? We didn't want to have 50 phone calls, so it was easier to create the list. David and I finished the list, and at 8.45 in the morning, I was reaching for stationery to create the list and print it out when suddenly we felt a muffled thump 
and the building sort of shuddered, a, little, a minor kind of explosion, not overly loud, and then the building began to tip as I'm tipping my hand, and it just kept tipping and tipping and tipping. We actually moved about 20 feet. The building kept tipping. David said, what's going on? I, I said, I don't know, what do you think? Uh, I said, do you think it was an explosion? He said, it didn't sound like it. And he said, was it an earthquake? And I said, no, because the building's not shaking from side to side or anything, it's going in one direction. Now I knew that, building, that the, the towers were made to buffet in winds, although I wasn't really thinking about that at the time, but the building kept tipping and hey, I grew up in Palmdale, right? Building moves, go stand in doorways. So I went and stood in the doorway to my office. Yeah, a lot of good that's really gonna do you 78 floors up, but hey, there I was. <laughs> David was just holding on to my desk. Roselle was asleep under my desk. And finally, David and I said goodbye to each other because we thought we were about to take a 78 floor plunge to the street. Then the building slowed down and it stopped and it came back the other way. And I remember as soon as the building started to move back, I let out my breath. I didn't even realize I was holding it. The building eventually got to be vertical again. As soon as it did, I went into my office and I met my guide dog, Roselle, coming out from under my desk. I took her leash and told her to heal, which meant to come around on my left side just like Alamo did. Good boy. He gets a reward for sitting. And Roselle came and sat and was just wagging her tail and about that time the building dropped straight down about six feet. Because as we know, the expansion joints went back to their normal configuration. We didn't really think about that at the time, but that's what they were doing. As soon as that occurred, David let go of the desk, turned around and looked around outside and said, oh my God, Mike, there's fire and smoke above us. There are millions of pieces of burning paper falling outside the window. We gotta get out of here right now. We can't stay here. I said, are you sure? Yeah, I can see the fire above us and there are millions of pieces of burning paper falling outside our windows. I heard stuff brushing the windows, but I didn't know what it was. Now I did. And our guests began to scream, the ones that were in eating breakfast, waiting for the seminar to start. They started moving toward our exit and I kept saying, slow down, David. No, we gotta get out of here right now. The building's on fire. Slow down, David. We'll get out, just be patient. No, we gotta get out of here right now. We can't stay here. For me, <coughs> emergency preparedness training, it kicked in because I, as you know, kept thinking, what do I do if there's an emergency? Well, here it was. Then David said the big line, Mike, we gotta get out of here. And I said, slow down. He says, no, you don't understand. You can't see it. <laughs> the problem wasn't what I wasn't seeing. The problem was what David wasn't seeing. What did I tell you about Roselle with thunderstorms? She wasn't doing any of that. She was wagging her tail and yawning and going, who woke me up? She wasn't giving any fear indication at all. And so I knew, good boy, that whatever was occurring, we weren't imminently, immediately threatened. So I finally got David to focus and say, get our guests to the stairs and start them down. And he did. While he was doing that, I called Karen, my wife, and said, there's been an emergency and something happened. We're gonna be evacuating. I'll let you know later what's going on. And she said, wait, what's, what, is, what is going on? I said, don't know. The airplane hit 18 floors above us on the other side of the building. Afterward, when reporters started interviewing me, they said, well, of course you didn't know what happened because you couldn't see it. And I said, wait a minute, help me understand. The plane hit on the 96th floor, roughly, on the other side of the building from us. The last time I heard there really wasn't such a thing as x-ray vision, none of us knew. Blindness had nothing to do with it. You can't justify that. None of us knew. And on the stairs, none of us knew. And we were with a whole bunch of people on the stairs. Anyway, David came back. I had uh, just disconnected with Karen. We swept the offices to make sure we didn't miss anyone. We tried to power down some equipment. Didn't really have time to do a lot of that and we just left and went to the stairs and started down. Almost immediately I began smelling an odor and it took me a little while to recognize that what I was smelling was burning jet fuel. I've traveled a lot through airports about 100,000 miles a year, so I knew that smell, but I didn't associate it with the World Trade Center. Now suddenly, I smelled it, and I recognized it finally after about four floors, and I observed it to others who said, yeah, that's what it is, you're right. So we kept walking down the stairs, got down about 10 floors, and then from above us we heard, burn victim coming through, move to the side, let us by. 
The stairs were wide enough that you could walk like two or three abreast, but we moved to the outer wall, stood facing in, and a group of people passed us. And David described how they were surrounding a woman who was very badly burned over the upper part of her body, probably from the little vapor droplets that combusted as uh, she was standing in front of an elevator. We then started walking again, and then we heard it again. Burn victim coming through, move to the side, let us by. And another group passed us with someone who was burned, as David said, even worse. We knew it had to be pretty bad above us. We kept walking down, some conversation. We got to about the 50th floor. David wasn't talking very much, and suddenly he said, Mike, we're going to die. We're not going to make it out of here. And I just said, stop it, David. If Roselle and I can go down these stairs, so can you. See, I took that secret teacher course that, that all of you as teachers have never told anybody about because you're sworn to secrecy, right? Voice 101, where you learn to yell at students, right? <laughs> and so I, I literally, very deliberately, spoke very harshly to David. And he told me that that brought him out of his funk. But then David made a decision, which I think is still one of the most profound and incredible decisions and follow-throughs that I experienced that day. David said, you know, I got to keep my mind on it, on what's going on, but I don't, I don't want to think about this. I want to think about something else. So I'm going to walk a floor below you and shout up to you everything that I see on the stairs, okay? And I said, sure, go ahead. Did I need David to do that? No, right? You're going down the stairs. What can you do? But it was okay. And I'm glad to have more information. I love information. And so I thought it was fine. But the reason that I thought that what David did was so incredible will become evident in a moment. So suddenly I'm on the 49th floor. We, I walked down a floor and David walked ahead of us and suddenly, hey Mike, I'm on the 48th floor. Everything is good here, going on down. I'm on 49, going to 48 get to 48. David, 47th floor, all clear. What David was doing, although he was shouting up to me, he was providing information that hundreds or thousands of people on the stairwell could hear. He gave everyone a focus point. Anyone who could hear him knew that somewhere above them or below them on the stairs, someone was okay and that it was clear and they could keep going. He gave everyone something to focus on. And I think that that was the one thing more than anything else that had to keep more people from possibly panicking like he started to do on the stairs. We didn't have any other incidents of that after David started shouting. 46th floor, all clear. Hey, I'm on 45, everything is good here. 44th floor, this is where the Port Authority cafeteria is. Not stopping, going on down. <laughs> And we continued down the stairs. We eventually got to the 30th floor. And when we did, actually David did, and I was at 31, he said, I see, I see firefighters coming up the stairs. We're going to have to let them by. Everybody move to the side. Well, I went down to where he was, and they hadn't got there yet. I said, what do you see? And he said, well, I just see them coming up the stairs. They got heavy backpacks on, and they're carrying shovels, oxygen cylinders, fire axes. The first guy gets to us, and he stops right in front of me and wouldn't let me by. He goes, hey, buddy, you OK? You know that's how they sound in New York, right? Hey, buddy, yo. In New Jersey, it's yo. And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Well, that's really nice. We're going to send somebody to the, down the stairs with you to make sure you get out. And I said, you don't need to do that. I'm good. Well, that's really nice, but we're going to send somebody with you anyway. I said, look, I just came down from the 78th floor. Here we are at 30. I came down 40th floor. I'm really good. Well, that's really nice. We're going to send somebody down the stairs with you anyway. <laughs> I said, look, I got my guide dog, Roselle, here, and, and everything is good. We're doing fine. Now, what a nice dog. And he reaches out and he starts petting Roselle. It wasn't the time to give him a lecture, don't pet a guide dog in harness. <laughs> but I'll give you the lecture, don't pet a guide dog in harness. Dog and harness, do not come up, don't say name, don't interact with, even don't make eye contact. Dog in harness is working. Harness is symbol of work. Don't distract dog. If you do, I will first correct the dog before I deal with you, because Rose, uh, Alamo should know better. He is still a puppy, though, and dogs love to interact. And so when you start trying to talk with them, they're going to talk to you. They're going to try. And then I have to bring him back and focus him. I don't want to do that. 
So don't deal with a guide dog and harness. Now, as I said before, when we're out selling books later, harness will come off and you're welcome to visit with him all you want. Of course, I'd love you to buy books too. <laughs> and take business cards, because if any of you know anyone who needs a public speaker, whether it's in your district or other organizations, I would love you to, uh, to let me know or let them know, because this is what I do, and I really would love your help to, to do more of this, to educate people. We can talk more about that later. In any case, it wasn't the time to give them that lecture, and it wasn't the time to say to the fire person, blindness isn't the problem, it's your attitude, you know? <laughs> so I finally just played the card, look, I got my friend David over here, David can see we're working together okay, and he turns to David, you're with him! David goes, yeah, leave him alone, he's good. He says, okay, and he goes and he pets Roselle a few more times, she gives him a few more kisses, and he goes on up the stairs. Probably just having received the last unconditional love he ever got in his life. And I remember that every time I say it, I don't know, I never heard whether they survived or not, but don't know that he did. But he was gone, other firefighters were coming up, 50 men and women passed us going up the stairs to fight that fire. Several of us on one or more occasions said, can we help you guys? And they just said, no, your job's to go down and get out, ours is to go deal with this, we got it. David reassumed his scouting position and we kept going down the stairs. Finally, David said, well, at about the 26th floor, by the way, um, somebody started passing up water bottles. Roselle was panting. It was getting pretty warm with all the, the mass of human bodies. So we, um, we gave Roselle some water. Somebody passed up bottles and David brought one up and he took some drinks. I took some drinks. We gave Roselle some. We made our hands into kind of cups and so everybody got some water and then we continued and finally he got to the first floor. I was on floor second, floor two, and he said, hey Mike, the water sprinklers are on here, you're going to have to run through a curtain of water to get out of the, the stairwell. And the water was running to create a barrier so fire wouldn't get in or out depending on if it ever broke out. He was gone. I got to the first floor, picked up the harness, Roselle, forward, hop up, speed up which is the command to give. We raced through this torrential downpour of water and came out the other end soaking, but we were in the lobby of Tower One. Normally a very quiet building and quiet lobby office type environment, but now people were shouting, don't go that way, don't go outside, go this way. Megaphones, don't go over there, go this way. Go to the doors into the main part of the complex, don't go outside. They didn't want anyone going out because that would have put them right below where people were jumping, but we didn't know that at the time. So this guy comes up to David and me, and he says, hey, I'm with the FBI, I'll get you where you need to go, and I'm sitting there going, the FBI, what did I do? I didn't do it. <laughs> Besides, I'm not talking to anybody but McGarrett from 5-0. Um, <laughs> I did think that. Anyway, I said, what's going on? He said, no time to tell you, just come with us. So he ran us through the whole complex and out a door after going up an escalator by Borders Books as far away from the towers as we could be. And we made it outside and we were told to leave the area, but David looked around and said, Mike, I see fire in tower two. I said, what? Yeah, there's fire in the second tower. You sure? Yeah. And I went, what's going on? We had no idea where that came from. We didn't feel a thing in our building when we were going down the stairs. So we thought perhaps it was just fire that jumped across from our building when the building tipped, it was actually pointed toward Tower 2. We didn't know. So we left the area, we walked over to Broadway, we walked north on Broadway and eventually we got to Vesey Street where we stopped because David decided to see the fire in Tower 2 really well. Um, we're only 100 yards or so away, I wanna take pictures. So we stopped, he got out his camera I got out my phone, I tried to call Karen, I couldn't get through, the circuits were busy because as we now know everyone was, everyone was saying goodbye to loved ones. But I couldn't get through to Karen, 
I had just put my phone away, and David was putting his camera away when a police officer yelled, get out of here, it's coming down, and we heard this rumble that quickly became this deafening roar. I described the sound as kind of a combination of a freight train and a waterfall. You could hear glass tinkling and breaking, metal clattering, and then this white noise sound as Tower 2 collapsed at Pancake straight down. David turned and ran. He was gone. Everyone was running in different directions. I bodily lifted Roselle, turned 180 degrees, and started running back the way we came. Come on, Roselle, keep going. Good girl, keep going. We ran, got to Fulton Street, turned right onto Fulton Street, and now we're going west. At least we had a building between us and the towers. I ran about maybe 100 feet or so, and suddenly there was David. It turns out we had both run in the same direction, and then he realized that he had just left me. He was going to come back and try to find me. But I found him first, and he started apologizing. I said, David, don't worry about it. The building's coming down. Let's keep going. And we started to run. And then we were engulfed in the dust cloud, all the dirt and debris and the fine particles of Tower 2 that were collapsing, that were, that were coming down. And so David um, and I were now engulfed in this cloud. He said he couldn't see his hand six inches in front of his face. I could feel, with every breath I took, stuff going through my mouth and through my nose, into my throat, and settling in my lungs. That's how thick it was. I could feel it settling in my lungs. So we kept running, and we knew we had to get out of that. So I started telling Roselle, right, right, with hand signals and voice. I don't know whether she could hear me, and because of the dust, I don't even know if she could see me. Right, Roselle, right. But I was listening for an opening on my right, and the first opening I heard, I was going to go into it. And obviously, Roselle did know what I want, because when that first opening appeared, I heard it, but she immediately turned right. She took one step, and she stopped, and she wouldn't move. Come on, Roselle, keep going. She wouldn't move. And I realized there must be a reason. So I stuck a hand along a wall and stuck out a foot and realized and discovered that we were at the top of a flight of stairs. She had done her job perfectly. We walked down two flights of stairs and found ourselves in a little arcade a lobby of a subway station. We <coughs> continued, uh, to, well, we just stayed there for a while, and then this guy comes up. He introduced himself as Lou, an employee of the subway system, and he took us down to the um, lower levels of the subway station to an employee locker room. And when we got to the locker room, there were benches. There were about eight or nine of us who were in the lobby at that point, that little arcade. There were other people that he had already escorted down. So we were all in this employee locker room. There was a water fountain. There were benches. There was a fan. We were all hacking and trying to get rid of stuff from our lungs and not saying much. What the heck was going on? None of us knew. Uh, we were there for a few minutes, and then a police officer came, and he said, the air is clear up above. You're going to have to, to leave and, um, and go out of here right now. So we followed him up the stairs. He went to that little arcade lobby where we had been, and then he went on up the stairs. He said, the air is a little bit better up there, and um, we just followed him. And finally, we went outside after getting to the top. David looked around, and he said, oh my god, Mike, there's no Tower 2 anymore. And I said, what do you see? And he said, all I see are pillars of smoke where the tower was. It's gone. Are you sure? Yeah, it's gone. We stood there for a moment, <clears throat> and then we just turned and continued to walk west on Fulton Street. We walked for about maybe a quarter of a mile, and we were in this little plaza area just still trying to figure out what was happening when suddenly we heard that freight train waterfall sound again, and we knew it was Tower 1 collapsing. David looked back and saw it, and he saw a dust cloud coming toward us again. It was still pretty concentrated, so we kind of ran to the side to get out of most of it, hunkered down behind a wall, and just waited until everything passed us by and the wind subsided, the noise stopped. And then we stood up, turned, David looked around and said, oh my God, Mike, there's no World Trade Center anymore. I said, what do you see? And he said, fingers of fire and flame, hundreds of feet tall and pillars of smoke, the towers are gone. We had gone in three hours before, less than three hours before just to do our job, but now in the blink of an eye it was gone. No clue why. We stood there for a moment, 
And then I decided I better try to call Karen, and this time I got through. And after some tears on both sides of the phone, she told us how two aircraft had been crashed into the towers, one into the Pentagon, and a fourth was still missing over Pennsylvania. We walked up toward Midtown and eventually got near Midtown Manhattan to the subway station at, uh, and the train station at 33rd and 6th and 7th Avenue. And um, David and I set parted and went different ways. I wanted to get back home to Westfield. He wanted to get up to the Upper East Side to his sister's house, which is where he was staying when he was back in New York. And so we went our separate ways and never, never thinking that that was the end in a lot of ways. We did try to reopen the office elsewhere, but didn't get a lot of support from the company and decided that uh, for me, um, it was time to do something different. The reason I decided that was that the day after September 11th, the 12th, Karen said, you ought to call the folks from Guide Dogs for the Blind. That's where you've gotten all your guide dogs. You ought to let them know that you were in the Trade Center and got out because eventually they would remember it. A number of them had visited us in our office because it's such a cool view. I don't know how to tell you about the view so much other than to say we were so high up that on the 4th of July, people would go to our office to look down on the fireworks displays. So um, I called them and talked to a number of people, including their public information officer, Joanne Ritter, who wanted to do a story, and I said, sure. And she said, you know, you're probably going to get requests to be on TV. What TV show do you want to start with? So, you know, I'm not really thinking about that sort of stuff, right? Kind of still in shock. So I just said, Larry King live. <laughs> Two days later, on the 14th, we had the first of five interviews with Larry King. And so we started doing that, and eventually Guide Dogs asked me to come and be a public spokesper their public spokesperson. And I was being asked by that time to travel and speak and tell my story. And people said, we want to hire you. Being a sales guy, I'm sitting there going, you want to hire me just to come and talk? That sounds a whole lot more fun than working for Quantum. And we wanted to move back to California anyway. So I accepted Guide Dog's position, and I've been speaking ever since. Other things have happened along the way very quickly, including I was asked in 2015 by a startup company, Ira, A-I-R-A, to join their advisory board. And Ira makes a product called Visual Interpreter. It consists of an app on a smartphone, and it may also include smart glasses with a high-resolution video camera. And what Ira allows me to do is to contact an agent who has been hired and vetted and trained to describe whatever the camera sees and whatever information I need. So they can help with inaccessible websites. They helped me put together um, products when the instructions were all visual pictures. The Chinese have learned from Ikea. And um, in so many other ways that literally now uh, any visual information becomes available with Ira. I just really want to quickly show you Hello, Ira, Ira and we can, uh, we can talk more about Ira this afternoon in the, uh, the session at 345. Calling but Ira I want you agent. to see what Ira does. So hopefully Connecting we'll... to Agent Kenyon, starting video, We're going to get wait. someone. Hello, Michael. Thanks for calling Myra. This is Kenny. What would you like to do today? Kenny, I'd like you to tell me what you see. I see a very large crowd right now. Large, shiny, large. Yeah. What else? And a podium. Uh-huh. See a mic, um, and it looks like a very large auditorium. See some doors toward the back, exit signs, and a very captive crowd. Um, here's the real question. Do they look like they're awake? <laughs> They are now. Uh, <laughs> so we're good. So uh, tell them what you do. I uh, assist those who are sight challenged with uh, independence on a daily basis. Uh, we allow them to be more independent in their daily lives, to get around with uh, minimal help, and we basically help them to see. How do you do that? What do you do? 
Uh, we use descriptives. We use, we call in as we did now, and we ask them, what would you like to do? And we assist them with whatever their um, task may be for that day, whether it be for reading, navigation, um, calling in Ubers, travel, um, descriptives, you name it, we can do it. Uh, we do that through either... Uh, I believe you're using the glasses right now. I am. We have Verizon glasses we use, yeah. and then or through technology and the phones, we use um, remote cameras to help them to see the world around them and to describe it to them and to help them navigate through it. Two real quick stories. Um, one, one IRA agent helped someone once while they were on an African safari to describe what was going on. But my favorite IRA story is that a father once wanted to find out if his daughter was really doing her homework, so he activated Ira, and he went in with the agent and said, how are things going? And she said, oh, great, I'm almost done with my homework. And the Ira said, Ira Asian said, no, she's playing a game on her iPhone. <laughs> yes, we also bust children whenever we need to. Yeah. Kenny, I, I appreciate your time. I'm going to go ahead and finish chatting with these folks, but appreciate you uh, and taking the time to chat today. You bet. Thanks for calling Ira Michael, and we'll talk to you again. See you Thank later, you, folks. sir. Bye. Bye-bye. Good. And, and, that's what, and that's what Ira is all about. I don't know that one. Um, the whole, the whole point is that I get access to all the information I otherwise don't have access to because ironically in our modern technological world, sometimes it's actually becoming harder for me to get access to information. Too many websites are inaccessible and shouldn't be. Too many books may be scanned, but they're not put in a textual form that I have access to. There have been lawsuits over that. Um, but the bottom line is that IRA creates access, or I should say it creates inclusion. It gives me access to the information that I otherwise wouldn't have access to. So I'll be glad to show that to any of you later. Um, what I'd like to do is to end this now with some words from Dr. Tembrook, that I, uh, the person I mentioned earlier. This is part of a speech that he gave at the 1956 convention of the National Federation of the Blind in San Francisco. So it, it is a convention of blind people, but what I'm reading to you now could just as easily apply to any group. And I'm sure that Dr. Tembrick intended it that way. And this is what he wrote. In the 16th century, John Bradford made a famous remark which has ever since been held up to us as a model of Christian humility and correct charity, and which you saw reflected in the agency quotations I presented earlier. Seeing a beggar in his rags creeping along a wall through a flash of lightning in a stormy night, Bradford said, but for the grace of God, there go I. Compassion was shown, pity was shown, charity was shown, humility was shown. There was even an acknowledgement that the relative positions of the two could and might have been switched. Yet, despite the compassion, despite the pity, despite the charity, despite the humility, how insufferably arrogant. There was still an unbridgeable gulf between Bradford and the beggar. They were not one, but two. Whatever might have been, Bradford thought himself Bradford and the beggar a beggar. One high, the other low. One wise, the other misguided. One strong, the other weak. One virtuous, the other depraved. We do not and cannot take the Bradford approach. It is not just that beggary is the badge of our past and is still all too often the present symbol of social attitudes toward us, although that is at least a part of it, but in the broader sense, we are that beggar and he is each of us. We are made in the same image and out of the same ingredients. We have the same weaknesses and strengths the same feelings, emotions, and drives. And we are the product of the same social, economic, and other environmental forces. How much more consonant with the facts of 
individual and social life, how much more a part of a true humanity to say instead, there within the grace of God, do go I. And I want to leave you with that because I think that sums it up as well as I can possibly do. We're all in the same world together and you have the awesome responsibility to help children and perhaps their parents grow and truly become more included in society. So this afternoon, I'll be talking about the concept of moving from diversity to inclusion, and I'll tell you why I choose that title, and I'll tell you now. When you watch television, you hear all about diversity. How often do you ever hear disabilities mentioned? You don't. Hollywood doesn't mention us. The candidates aren't mentioning us in all the political debates. Even though 20% of the population has some sort of a disability, not including politicians who have their own disabilities, but we won't go there. <laughs> we need to demand and we ask your help to create a true inclusive society. I challenge you to do that. I hope we get to, to chat later. Come to the presentation this afternoon and come and see us. We'll be selling Thunderdog books and you can visit with Alamo and um, also, again, if you know anyone else who needs a speaker, it's what I do, as you can tell. Did, did you all feel you learned something today? Well, vendors and everyone alike, thanks very much, and I hope we get to chat some more. Thank you.